Good morning, uh, dear all. I am happy to welcome everybody to our sixth annual East African Conference, which we are holding in an online format for the first time ever, as we now have to live in the new norm and ensure everyone's health and safety. We are excited that despite, or maybe thanks to the virtual format, the event has a strong turnout. We have scheduled close to 100 one-on-one -on -one meetings between 20 East African companies representing a wide range of sectors. Financial sector, insurance, real estate, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, telcos, breweries, consumer and retail, and utilities. We also have 90 top international and local investors with total AUMs of over 3.6 trillion US dollars. In addition to the one-on-one -on -one meetings, we will host two public panel sessions with great speakers, one on macro and the other for businesses. I would like to thank everyone for attending our conference. Renaissance Capital has been committed to Africa for almost 15 years. Back in 2006, Kenya and Nigeria became the company's stepping stone to growing its operations across the continent. And we continue to be an important part of the global business. Although uh, we do miss the face-to-face -face interaction, I know most of the international investors do miss Nairobi. We definitely appreciate the opportunity to reconnect with our clients and investors, the media, and other stakeholders on the most recent developments and outlook for Kenya and East Africa. Speaking of the outlook, and based on our SSA recent report, we expect a V-shaped recovery in Kenya from third quarter of this year. Kenya is likely to lead the recovery in the SSA region. We will discuss the recovery drivers today in our macro panel session. Tomorrow, we will proceed with corporates representing diverse sectors. We will talk over the post-19 COVID world and how to emerge from the crisis in better shape. Before we start the first panel session, I would like to give the floor to my colleagues for a brief macro presentation. Yvonne Mohango, SSA economist with more than 10 years experience in the 10 years experience working as an SSA specialist. We are proud that this year she has once again been ranked number one in her category by the Financial Mail Survey. Charles Robertson, we all, we all know Charlie, Global Chief Economist, Head of Macro Strategy. Charlie is a renowned Imagine and Frontier Market Specialist, a clear opinion leader who covers a wide scope of themes including demographics, education, electricity, ESG, fertility, pension funds, saving, as well as ways to examine exchange rates in emerging and frontier markets. Yvonne, Charlie, over to you, Asante and Karibu. Thank you and welcome. Thanks very much, Stanley. Um, you, you missed out virus expert, which is all I've been doing for about six months. Has been absolutely <laughs> missing about this. Um, but I, so I'm going to give you just a, a few slides on the on the big picture story. Um, hopefully, can can uh, we can uh, let's, let's just go through this uh, sharing business. Um, so, what I'm leading off with is you just watched the latest on the virus numbers in East Africa. We've got a few countries um, shown here. Uh, Kenya's on our top left hand side. Um, I've put in Uganda, Rwanda. Um, I've left off. Tanzania, because as you know, they've not been releasing any data since May. Uh, what's been interesting about East Africa is it hasn't been hit badly by the virus, uh, based on the data that we can see. Um, there's, there's been a recent pickup in Ethiopia, but uh, none of the numbers are that significant. If you look at cases per 100,000 people, total as of yesterday morning, um, you know, in the States, it was nearly 2,000 people in every 100,000 of have been confirmed with the virus, um, and, and in Kenya it's, it's just 71. Um, I think the whole debate on the virus is moving, has moved quite a long way in the last few months. Um, most significant is that 
I don't think lockdown, serious national lockdown, such as we saw in Europe in March, April, or, or China in January, February, I don't think that's going to happen in any uh, low-income country, apart from possibly a place like Vietnam, which had been quite successful, um, but, but it's got a few problems recently. And, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, the reason we're not going to see big national lockdowns is, firstly, they often don't work. And I think South Africa, India, and Peru are the best examples of that. They've seen massive GDP declines after very significant lockdowns, but they didn't stop the virus spread. Um, the second reason is that thanks to the youth, particularly the youth of Africa, the youthful population, the, the damage, the danger to the population is much, much less significant. Um, and, and that is true of India, but even more so of Africa, um, much less significant. So when we looked at the number of uh, the, the population that was vulnerable to the virus, um, by weighting the various age groups, um, we, we worked out that the vulnerable population was rounded down about 0% in Kenya and, and, and much of Africa. And we're seeing that in the data. So far, uh, the deaths, this was a couple of days ago in Kenya, 599 deaths from COVID. Uh, that's 0% of a normal uh, death toll in a year. Um, this is a very a crude, nasty economist way of talking about it, but it's just trying to point out that, that it's not having the same health hit. So I don't think we've got significant lockdown issues uh, to worry about in the future. There is second wave concerns for Europe, potential lockdown. I'm, I'm skeptical they'll do it, but, but I, I don't think we're gonna get it in, in, particularly in the countries we're focusing on in this conference. Um, so we don't have to worry about domestic demand so much being hit. It's more the second round effects from, from, from the global economy. Perhaps the biggest, most important long-term second round effect uh, is, is going to be the much lower debt yields that I think we're going to have in the West. Um, and this has been a trend that's been ongoing for a decade already in the States and Germany. It's falling bond yields on the right-hand side. Um, I think tracking Japan which, which began this process in 1990. When, when on the left-hand side, different scale, bit of chart crime, I'm sorry about that. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see Japanese bond yields going from 8% down to about, what, 1% uh, through the 1990s. And we're seeing Germany and, and the US echoing that. Germany very much so, and, and, and America with a lag. I don't think we're gonna see US Treasury yields uh, above 2% in the coming decade. And it wouldn't surprise me if we're at zero by 2030. And there is going to be a desperate bid for yield from global investors. Right now, they're putting the money into US equities and the NASDAQ until a few days ago. But I think they'll end up putting it into EM bonds. They've already been doing that. If you go back 20 years, emerging market bond yields were about 12%, according to this bond index. 10 years ago, they were 6%. Today, they're 4%. And it won't surprise me if emerging markets, and I mean kind of mainstream emerging markets at this point, see yields dropping down below 3%, perhaps even 25 by 2030. And that would justify big increases in debt without any increase in the debt burden. So the, the interest burden might be 5% of GDP. When you've got 40% of debt in, in 2000, it's still 5% of GDP with 120% of GDP in 2020. Now, those GDP estimates are just guides as to what to point out how much more affordable debt is. And I think Africa will be a big, big beneficiary of this, partly because the yields are still higher because most African credits are still single B uh, and a few double B credits. Uh, we've seen, excluding South Africa and Egypt, a tenfold increase in issuance of euro bonds by sub-Saharan issuers or by African issuers uh, in the last decade. And I think it's going to get vastly bigger than that. And this is, uh, this is good news because all that work on demographics and fertility that we did last year was trying to highlight that until you get your fertility rate down to about two to three kids per woman, the banking sector remains fairly small, 
and interest rates remain fairly high. And so the ability to domestically finance your own investment, but it, it's still quite expensive. Um, now that's going to change. Uh, and, and most obviously it's going to change in uh, Egypt, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Ghana. All those countries are going to see uh, the number of kids per woman drop from three to four at the moment down to two to three, which is where the green countries are now. Uh, and, and therefore, I think, see an increase in savings and falling interest rates. So cheaper to finance domestically. That's going to happen in the 2030s. But what can happen in the 2020s is using that, that external cash uh, available from the West um, to, to borrow more cheaply and kickstart some of that investment in infrastructure that economies need. What else do I think is a really big deal right now? Uh, I think the US election matters a great deal. Uh, and this is because Trump has been pushing a protectionist theme, uh, a theme which, which we're seeing via trade wars that's hurt uh, emerging markets and has contributed to dollar strength. I think he's gonna lose because all US presidents lose when they have a recession in the first term even if it's not their fault, as I'm sure President Carter would have said in 1980 uh, in the wake of the Iranian uh, revolution and the oil price spike. So Trump's likely to lose, and I think that means the dollar is likely to weaken. It's already happened quicker than I expected. I thought this was a post-November story. Um, to some extent, we're already seeing that now because US Fed funds are so cheap, because the... Um, because of these trends that are already underway. And I think a, a belief then that the dollar is not necessarily the place to put your cash anyway. But I think it's going to get intensified by Biden's victory in November. Um, as I've pointed out before, adult education is a much improved story across, across Africa over the last decade or two. Most countries are now have the adult literacy needed to industrialize. Uh, and Kenya is over 80%, which is why it's dark green there. Uh, it's the best in the region, uh, according to the latest figures from the World Bank. So the education's there. The one problem we still see, or I still see from, from looking at the work we've done is electricity. Um, and, and you've got that chicken and egg situation. You've got to have too much electricity so that anyone putting a factory into Kenya or East Africa knows there's supply there. But the factories don't come to, 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 to use the electricity until until the supply is already in place. So you get this slightly awkward chicken and egg situation. Um, cheaper financing, where building up that electricity capacity isn't too burdensome, really helps. And this is why the 2020s and this big savings glut from the West, the, the older and older West, people looking for yield, it could be, could be such a big deal. Um, I'm gonna stop there and, and hand over to Yvonne for a bit more information actually on East Africa rather than big picture. But I think this is a really, uh, it's gonna be a really interesting decade um, for, for Frontier and it's a huge opportunity to kickstart and achieve that faster growth, take advantage of the demographic dividend that's coming. Um, and I will stop there. Yvonne, over to you. Un you need to unmute. Thanks, Charlie. I hope you can all see my presentation. I'll be speaking um, through a few slides on East Africa. We expect the East African region, let me make that into a PowerPoint presentation. There. We expect the East African region to lead the recovery in Sub Saharan Africa. And we expect the economies um, of East Africa to emerge uh, or to be among the first to emerge from this particular crisis in Sub Saharan Africa. Early in the year, we scored um, the frontier markets in sub-Sahara uh, using seven resilience measures that are across um, the top of the table you see on your screen. Um, and then we ranked them based on their resilience score. So the countries at the top of the table you see there are the ones that scored strong in terms of their resilience, which for us implied that they'll be among the first to emerge from the crisis. And you can see among the, uh, the top five countries that we've got three East African countries, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Rwanda, and Kenya falls in the second quarter of the table. And so, as you can see from this, East Africa generally scores pretty high in terms of resilience. And part of the reason for that is uh, uh, the sizable agriculture sectors 
in uh, this part of the world, uh, which uh, for us implies that uh, households, at least those involved in agriculture, are uh, insulated from the worst of the crisis. And indeed, if you look at Kenya's uh, GDP growth number for the first quarter, um, the growth number came at around 4.9%, which was a moderate slowdown from 5.5% a year earlier. And a big reason for that uh, good performance was agriculture. And this was despite the decline that we saw in the hotels and restaurants sector. So we're expecting Kenya to have a good year on the agriculture front. This is on the back of good rains. And we expect that to counter the negative impact on the hospitality industry. Our growth forecast for Kenya for this year is 1.5%. If we look at what's happening in the hospitality industry, um, and uh, tourist arrivals in particular, you can see there's been a collapse, uh, particularly in the second quarter of the year, and that, of course, reflects the travel restrictions. Uh, according to the statistics office, um, tourist arrivals dropped by 99% to under 2,000 arrivals in the second quarter of the year. And that's from over 300,000 just a year earlier. So that gives you an indication of how severely the sector has been hit by the crisis. And that is expected to reflect in the GDP number that's due to come out end of this quarter uh, um, for the second quarter of, um, um, for Kenya. However, if you look at the current account, um, on the trade balance side, it does look as though the impact there, at least in the year to April, um, hasn't been as significant uh, on the trade balance. And that's because any fall we did see in exports uh, was mitigated by a decline in imports. And that's likely due to the low oil price. Um, however, if you do look at uh, net services receipts, that did drop by a third in the year to April. And that reflects your hit to travel and tourism receipts. If we look at the foreign reserves position, however, that's remained uh, pretty um, steady. And that, of course, was helped by the inflows of loans of around $1.7 billion earlier this year from the IMF and World Bank. And that's helped shore up reserves. And they're still they're sitting at around 5.4 months of import cover, uh, which we think is pretty decent and supportive of the shilling. If we move on to um, inflation, uh, Kenya is uh, probably a minority amongst the key economies in sub-Sahara uh, that has seen a slowdown in inflation. It's been pretty benign sitting at around 4.4% in uh, August. Um, and um, that's uh, supported this monetary easing that we've seen. The central bank has cut the policy rate by 125 basis points, sitting at around 7%. And we do think the benign inflation outlook going forward does suggest that the central bank can maintain an accommodative policy stance, which would be supportive of growth. And if we move on to the fiscus, as you can imagine, that's been hit hard, um, mainly by the slowdown in growth, which of course has implied that revenues have fallen. Uh, if we look at the deficit for the year that ended in June of this year, that widened to 8.3% of GDP, which is two percentage points um, bigger than initially targeted. And that was largely due to revenue shortfall. Uh, this year, the government is projecting a deficit of 7.5%. That's for the, for the year that ends next June. Um, we think there's a risk of that being breached due to uh, revenue shortfall. If we move on just to the rest of um, East Africa, I look at currencies here. We like East African currencies uh, because uh, a couple of them do trade close to their fair value. That implies uh, low volatility. And uh, if you look at the um, currencies in that oval that's drawn on that chart, you have the Rwandan franc, Tanzanian shilling, and Ugandan shilling, uh, which are trading close to their fair value and hence uh, relatively steady. The Kenyan shilling is a little more misaligned uh, from its fair value compared to its neighbors. However, as I've mentioned earlier, the external position remains relatively solid. The current account hasn't deteriorated as, as significantly as many feared, and the reserves position remains as, uh, comfortable enough to support a stable shilling. If we move on to the next slide, we've got growth forecasts here. These are IMF and World Bank growth forecasts. Uh, for the sub-Saharan African countries. And amongst the countries that are projected to grow, you can see that there's a good showing of East African economies. Uganda's projected to grow at around 1.8 to 3.3% uh, this year. If you look at Tanzania, that's between 1.9 and 2.5%. Rwanda at around 2%. Uh, Kenya is projected to grow by 1.5% by the World Bank, but the IMF is projecting a small decline of around 0.3%. Inflation, um, the commonality in East Africa is that it has remained in single digits. 
Tanzania, similarly to Kenya, has seen its, its inflation numbers soften. However, we have seen a moderate pickup in Uganda and a stronger pickup in the case of Rwanda. And the rest of East Africa, similarly to Kenya and most countries globally, did ease uh, monetary policy stance to support growth. Um, low inflation made that possible, but as you can see in Rwanda's case, that has implied negative uh, real uh, rates, at least when it comes to the policy rate. And that's it. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, we will now move on to the panel discussion. Thank you. Is it just Celts who are allowed to work for the Kenyan uh, people with Celtish blood? Because we know, you know, obviously know the Irishman who's been around <laughs> forever and ever. You are you are live now. Oh, okay, hello again, everybody. Um, I'll be moderating today's macro panel session titled East Africa, 
leading Sub-Saharan Africa's recovery. We have three distinguished persons on our macro panel this morning. Uh, we are delighted to have the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Sheila Mbejiwe. We also have the IMF representative for Kenya, Tobias Rasmussen, and our Global Chief Economist at Renaissance Capital, Charles Robertson. The panel discussion will focus on East Africa's recovery from the COVID pandemic and its associated restrictions. The panel participants will look into the factors that are playing in Kenya's favor for a swifter recovery compared to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. They'll also discuss how the country can exploit those conditions to its benefit. Two of the panelists will kick off the panel session with short presentations, followed by a Q&A session. I would now like to invite Deputy Governor Mbejue to start off the panel session with her presentation. Deputy Governor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much um, and welcome everyone to this session and thank you for Renaissance Capital. Um, it's very important that the African story be told and obviously these forums are the opportunity for us to tell these stories. And obviously I can't, in this time of COVID, not also wish everyone health and safety. Um, we would wish that the world will quickly recover on this menace that has, has hurt all of us. Um, what I want to do today is really to talk about the economic status of Kenya, and I can have my slides put up now, please. Um, and really look at what the situation is in Kenya following COVID, the state of the economy, and what our post-COVID strategies would be. So going to my introduction, slide three, please. Um, a lot has changed since the advent of COVID um, across the globe and in Kenya. Uh, when we look at the global numbers of growth that were projected, we had about 4.9% uh, 2019, and now we're looking at about 2.9%. So we can see in a matter of weeks, all the forecasts, all the outlooks changed dramatically. And this was a health uncertainty, which is something new to the world. We're used to other financial crises. But it's very unusual, it's been very unusual for the whole world to be hit so dramatically by something that came down to health. Um, Africa has equally been set up by the pandemic, um, but differently. And I think today that's what we're trying to say. We're trying to understand because there sometimes is this African view, a story of Africa as if we're all the same, and we're not. So this is now looking at the mixed, um, the mixed reactions, the mixed outcomes that have come across the continent. Kenya began 2020 quite strong, um, and I think this has helped us significantly as the pandemic came in. When I look at our growth, we had growth in 2019 of 5.4. We had projected growth of 2020 in the sixes. Um, inflation was anchored at 5.8 as, as in March when, when COVID hit. The deficit was also declining. Uh, at that time, 5.8% uh, GDP um, for 2019. We had steady remittances flows, about $200 million a month. I mean, I think now they're about $250 million a month. Stable and resilient banking sector, strong foreign exchange, with over five months of import cover um, in our foreign reserves, and a stable exchange rate. So really, as COVID came in, I can have the next slide. Um, we were in a fair, we had a position that was fairly strong and had some buffers. Now, what happened then? Well, the first case was reported in Kenya on the 13th of March, and the epicenters of the pandemic have been the two largest cities, which are Nairobi and Mombasa. And I think, and I'm not a medic, uh, medical or health expert, but I think from what we've been seeing, it really peaked in these two cities in mid-July. Um, so if you like, we're seeing our numbers come down. I think mid-July, we were running at about 700 infections per day. Currently, we're running around 100 infections per day. So I believe that that's a sign that uh, we must have peaked and come out. Um, COVID has now moved to our counties, which is our um, upcountry areas. And this is a concern to us because obviously our cities have better health um, positions. And also there's a lot of our old age um, um, people that live outside of the main cities. However, um, there is huge advantages that the numbers will be lower. And we've also learned a lot about the, 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 the epidemic already. So let's just see how it goes. Um, total cases in Kenya today, 35,000 have been reported. 
21,000 recoveries so far. And as Charles said earlier, about 600 fatalities. So as with the rest of Africa, the impact of the pandemic has been muted um, in Kenya. Positivity rates are coming down, as I said. 80% um, plus of our cases are asymptomatic. But the uncertainty remains. I'm not a health expert, so I don't want to put to speak for them. Um, and I would say that the uncertainty remains. The next slide, please. What happened? Well, the pandemic hit us on the 13th of March. So really the first quarter was fairly well secured. And that's why we came out with 4.9% growth in the first quarter of 2020. Um, I think that uh, as we have heard from Yvonne, uh, we've had very good rainfalls and we have a great harvest. And so food prices are muted. Um, there was strong ICT growth throughout that quarter, um, which also positioned us, if you, if you can imagine, for, for what was coming with the pandemic and the use of, of all the technology. Um, and resilience, people forget we're also a regional logistics hub for, um, we're at the corridor for many African countries from our coastline through. So even when there's a pandemic, there's a need for that logistics to continue. So that has also that has also been rewarding that it didn't uh, collapse as much as it did in in other countries. Obviously, the accommodation, restaurants, and tourism were significantly uh, affected uh, from the date of the announcement of COVID in Kenya, and that resulted in also depressed service sector exports. Um, but remittances have remarkably remained quite steady, and I think year on year we're six point seven percent up. I put that down to the fact that the diaspora of Kenya send the money home for vulnerable members of society, of their family, or else as their second homes. And even during a pandemic, it's even more reason um, to support those, those, those ambitions. Next slide. Inflation is uh, well anchored. Inflation is well anchored. Um, inflation in July is 4.4%, down from 5.2% in August of, uh, yeah, down from 5.2% in August, sorry. And I think what we're saying is that that's really due to the good rains, um, low fuel prices, muted demand. Um, so we're not expecting that to change um, anytime soon. And our projection is that that would hold for the next 12 months in that region. Current account, um, this is the number that we're always debating and discussing. Um, it's narrowed to 4.7% of GDP in July, and this is from numbers of about 5.8% in 2019. Uh, recovery of total exports, 1.7% um, in the 12 months to July. Tea and horticulture have been prime movers on that. What we saw with tea was quite interesting because as soon as COVID um, became uh, prevalent around the world, there was almost a pre-purchasing of tea. So wherever people could see extra stocks, they were actually buying them. So our tea exports increased, um, particularly to the Arab countries, to Egypt um, and, and, and other countries as well. So instead of that um, declining, it in fact increased. Uh, horticulture as well has uh, done very well, uh, really quite well, um, really quite well. Um, we're quite proud of our banking sector. Um, they've responded uh, quite well to to, 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 to the, the crisis. Um, um, our ratios for capital and liquidity are above what's required. Uh, credit monitoring, we've, we've gone from 13.3% in July to 13.1% in June. I'll talk a little bit to that uh, during the answers and questions because uh, there's some other data that I can supply in, in supporting that, that, that comment. But what we're seeing is that among our our asset quality in our banking sector, the, the rate of de deterioration or the de rate of decline has stabilized. And that's because there's many structures in place um, to, to both at the planning stage when we first went into COVID and also now as we monitor what is happening throughout this COVID period. Uh, lending rates have also declined throughout this COVID period. Uh, lending rates have also declined, which was expected. Um, there was an accommodative monetary policy stamp that was adopted in March and there was the decrease in the CRR ratio, which obviously had an impact on liquidity within the market. 
banking sector faces really two key risks. One is health. And I'm proud to say that our banks, despite them not being health experts, have responded to the protocols very well. There's not been any instability across our banking sector because of health protocols. And wherever there's been a health issue, um, everybody has observed those protocols and the health, the staff um, of the banks and the customers of the banks, everything has been uh, fairly robust and calm. Um, and that was important for us to make sure it was put in place as this, as this, this, problem, um, as this problem came in. I think with the banks as well, it's worth mentioning that last year the average profitability of our banking sector was 23%. Um, this year, what we're seeing is around 17%, um, but it's, it's still profitable. And I think for many countries, um, they, would be, they would be very happy to have a 17% profit, despite a, a pandemic raging across the world. Uh, as usual, the banking sector will be guided um, by international guidelines and standards. Kenya is determined to collaborate with the rest of the world and to make sure that whatever our systems are, that they build the confidence because they're aligned to what is known as global best practices. Next slide, please. When we look at our foreign exchange, what we see is that the reserves are up at around 9 billion, um, where they've been now for quite a while, 5.4%, um, 5.4 months of import cover, uh, which is adequate for Kenya. And we have to also thank our institutional partners who responded quite quickly during the COVID crisis and uh, also gave us about $2 billion of crisis support. Um, the, the look of the Kenya shilling is sitting there in the middle. I think you can see the slides among the African economies as, um, as to how it's placed. There's a continual discussion around the pricing or the value of the shilling. Uh, we remain absolutely clear that the shilling is free and floating um, and that uh, the value, if it's misaligned, it's misaligned by a very, very small amount. Going on to the next slide, please. Public debt. Um, this one is more obviously uh, an area that's managed by our national treasury and not our central bank. But uh, it's important to note that we now have around 63 billion US dollars of debt which is about 66% of GDP um, as of June 2020. Obviously, last year, we were below the 60% in the 50% range. Um, and as a result of this pandemic, obviously, that has, that has increased. And, but the composition of our debt, I think people often talk about debt as a singular, and they don't look at the composition of the debt. 47.6% of our debt is domestic, and 52.4% of our debt is foreign. And of that domestic portion, 95 plus percent is locally owned. Um, it's invested by Kenyans in shillings in their government. And so you have to actually split the debt and understand which portion you're, 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 you're looking at. Um, we're all aware that uh, Kenya declined the key to off of the debt relief because it would have had uh, some impact on its commercial, its commercial lending terms. Um, so. It was, uh, it was preferable for us to, to not accept uh, that debt relief as a result. The de domestic debt target was achieved in 2019-2020. And as of 2021, um, in the first, what is it, two months of the year, two and a half months of the year, we have collected 47%, around 47% of the target. Um, so we're fairly comfortable with the domestic debt um, uh, achievement to be able to, to meet the target in, in the current year. Um, fiscal consolidation has been the talk of the day and the current Minister of Finance, the CS of the National Treasury, has spoken strongly to fiscal consolidation and the need um, for, for Kenya to achieve fiscal consolidation even in a COVID era. And I think if you look at the numbers below, you can see the ambition. In 2020, in 1920, we actually came in lower than, than was forecasted. Um, so this is, is evidence of the commitment to, to reduce um, um, the, the, the cost and, and rein in fiscal, some fiscal consolidation. Move to the next slide. 
So when, what's our focus as we go forward? Well, um, sustainability and stability. I think that is the central bank um, uh, focus. In the banking sector, we must manage the liquidity and the NPLs. Um, and we must, retain, we must retain the thrust of digital platforms um, that will bring efficiencies, transparency, um, accuracy into the future. We must follow global best practice, um, but use appropriate domestic solutions aligned to global best practice. Um, our national treasury needs to, 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 to continue to look at uh, fiscal consolidation we must support and improve prospects for the youth um, and the unemployed. Um, that is a problem that's come out of that. And global collaboration in trade and vaccine development. Looking forward, the last slide. Um, the Kenyan economy remains resilient due to its diversification and low dependency on natural resources for exports. The government um, was alert and responded quickly to the pandemic which has resulted in lower infection and fertility rates. And based on our assessment, COVID has had a significant impact on the economy, but there are good signs of recovery. These are visible. Um, these are all positive signs, but the uncertainty remains. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor. Um, it is encouraging to see indeed that COVID cases have this declined from their peak of 700 in July to 100 today. And it's also encouraging to note that uh, remittances have been resilient and that uh, to mention tea exports uh, actually improved, which is one of the reasons why the trade deficit hasn't deteriorated as much as ma many had feared. Uh, we'll now move on uh, to um, the IMF representative. Uh, I'd like to invite Tobias Rasmus to give us a few words. Um, on, and present the IMF's macro views. Tobias? Thank you, Yvonne, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, great pleasure to, to be with you, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. So um, in my remarks here, and I, I won't have a, a PowerPoint presentation, um, in my remarks, I'll like to discuss developments in the Kenya uh, economy and, and put them in a broader context of what we're seeing globally and in the region. Um, the IMF came out in June with an update of its regional economic outlook, the, the Rio, as we call it. Uh, so I'll use that as a starting point and, and then I'll touch on developments that we've seen subsequently uh, in, in the global economy and in Kenya. In, in the, the Rio for Sub-Saharan Africa uh, from June, uh, we painted a picture of an uh, economic situation that was worse than had been uh, anticipated in, in April in, in the world economic outlook, and also subject to much uncertainty. Um, in, in June, economic activity in sub-Saharan Africa was uh, projected to contract by some 3.2% uh, in 2020. Key elements going into that uh, reduced growth project projection relative to, uh, to April was a weaker external environment, uh, measures to contain uh, the COVID outbreak across countries, uh, and limited policy room for maneuver on, on, on the fiscal side in particular due to falling revenues and limited fiscal space. Um, but also very important to note that there were significant differences across country groups. Oil exporting economies, which had been hurt by the sharply lower oil prices, were projected to experience the biggest growth declines. Um, as a group, they were projected to grow by minus 4.9%. Um, more diversified economies were projected to do much better than that, um, a category uh, including Kenya. Uh, as, as groups, the EAC and, and WEMU countries were uh, the ones doing best in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
projected to grow on average by um, around one to one and a half percent in 2020. So low as these numbers may seem uh, overall, uh, they're really not bad compared to the rest of the world. Um, that's important to, to, to stress. Global growth was projected at minus 4.9%, with minus 8% in advanced economies and minus 3% in emerging markets and developing uh, countries as a whole. Um, okay, so, so, so that was the outlook in, in June. Now let, let's look at what has been happening in the past few months since those projections were put together. First, um, I would note that we're starting to get a full picture of what actually happened to economies in, in the second quarter of the year. Uh, not surprisingly, in many countries, it was the worst quarterly growth performance on, on record. Uh, we've seen year-on-year -year declines of uh, 10 to 15 percent in real GDP in many advanced economies. Yeah. Minus 17% in South Africa, minus 6% in, in Nigeria. The second point is that we're seeing uh, economies around the world starting to pick up uh, along with easing of COVID containment measures. The recovery is uneven. Some countries have seen COVID flare up and, and have had to, to tighten containment measures again. Uh, but overall, I, I think it's clear that the second quarter was the bottom for most countries uh, and activity is picking up uh, speed. In Kenya, uh, the bottom for economic activity was quite clearly in April, May. Uh, we've since then seen an uh, upturn in, in most activity indicators, um, as we've also been hearing just now from the deputy governor. Exports uh, <coughs> have been driven by a good year for agriculture. Uh, they're up solidly year on year in the latest data. Um, it, it's not a full recovery. Uh, electricity production uh, is down slightly from a year ago, uh, so are uh, imports, oil imports uh, in particular, but also non-oil imports. Um, hospitality, of course, is, is, is still deeply depressed, but overall there has been an important improvement in economic activity since uh, the trough in April, May. Uh, you see that on the streets here in Nairobi, where things are largely back to normal, traffic included. So, these uh, encouraging signs for economic activity, as we also have heard, have been reinforced by a significant improvement in, in COVID numbers over the past month or so. Um, but there are also important remaining challenges. Uh, COVID, of course, is, is, is still there. Uh, we don't have a, a cure yet. And, and with that, all the health challenges and risks. Many have lost their jobs. We've seen uh, significant declines in employment numbers in uh, the second quarter. Schools are still closed. Uh, this will, will have long-term costs. Uh, we've, on the fiscal side, seen government revenues suffer, uh, and, and with that, fiscal pressures that will have to be dealt with. In, in the financial sector and, and, and uh, private sector generally, um, a, a large proportion of loans were restructured following COVID, uh, given the hits to household and, and, and corporate balance sheets. Uh, what happens uh, when these loans mature? Will lenders be in a capacity to, to pay? So those, those are some of the, the key questions and, 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 and pressure points. Uh, 
overall, I, I, I think it, it's important to, to, to bear in mind that COVID has really been a, a shock of historic proportions. It would be wrong to assume that it'll be over, overcome quickly. But I, I, I think also looking at, at the numbers coming out of, of, of Kenya, uh, it, it's fair to say that the, the outturns here have, have so far been better than what we at the IMF expected in, in the June Rio update. Uh, at that time, we projected uh, growth of, of minus 0.3% for this year, as has been noted. Uh, so I, I, I think in, in the World Economic Outlook that comes out next month, we, we can expect uh, somewhat of an upward revision to that number. Let me end there. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Tobias. That's very encouraging to hear that um, most recent data coming out of Kenya um, is encouraging and that we may see enough of revision to that negative 0.3% growth number um, for Kenya. Um, we'll now head into the Q&A session. I invite those uh, watching and listening in to submit their questions uh, in the comment box, which is on the right-hand side of your video webcast. In the meanwhile, I'll kick off this discussion uh, with uh, a couple of questions. Um, I'll start off with um, uh, Tobias. I'll start off with uh, yourself. Um, contrary to other Sub-Saharan African markets, Kenya's inflation has remained uh, relatively low. I mean, if you look at Ghana's inflation, it's moved into the double digits uh, after being relatively stable in the 78% region last year. Nigeria has continued to accelerate in double digits. Zambia has gone up, but Kenya's has remained relatively low in the mid-single digits. What do you attribute that to? Is it um, largely below oil prices, or is subdued uh, demand also an issue, as that would speak to the consumer in Kenya? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, the low headline inflation, 4.4%, uh, uh, the latest reading for August, um, has been coming down mainly because food inflation has been coming down. Uh, if, if you look at core inflation, uh, stripping out food and, and fuel, uh, it, it's been low and, and stable, uh, steady at around 2% for uh, over a year. Uh, it, it's really in food that we've seen the big movement. Uh, food inflation was rising up to uh, the early months of, of this year, at, at some point reaching uh, around 15% uh, year on year. But it, it's been declining quite sharply uh, since that uh, to around 5% in, in the latest reading, I believe, uh, reflecting uh, the, the good harvest, the good year for, for agriculture that we've also been in seeing in, in the export numbers, as has been mentioned. So overall, I, I, I would say uh, underlying inflation in, in, in Kenya has, has been modest, uh, well anchored. The movement we've been seeing is, is really a story about uh, food, food prices. Okay. Thank you. Um, my next question is to the Deputy Governor, and this is a question that's come through uh, from, the, from some of the investors. Uh, they want to know when the central bank plans on giving its final approvals for the bank's risk pricing templates and what sort of pricing changes will the central bank not be happy with? Sorry, Deputy Governor, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And thank you for telling me I was on mute. Um, Kenya, Kenya's objective is to be a financial center of repute and uh, a financial place um, for international and local and Pan-African investors. And to do that, what we're trying to do is to get to a place where we can reflect the world's best practice. And I think Charles has mentioned already that pricing across the African continent has been problematic. Um, has been problematic. And when you look at some of the historic pricing approaches, 
is that there's an assumption that all customers are the same and therefore the pricing that's assigned is assigned to a block of customers. And what that means is that there's big inefficiencies in that pricing structure because some of the best credit is subsidizing some credit that is not, it is not of the same standard. And now we have all this automation and technology and modern solutions. It's really time that that differentiation between customers becomes apparent and that customers that have had and built a good credit um, uh, history can come to a bank and get a different pricing, although they belong to the same economic block as someone else, uh, because of the risk that they pose as, as, a point, as opposed to others. So what we're looking for is looking for all banks to start adopting this new approach. And we're very pleased that the digital banking um, phenomena has actually brought that out even more. Um, and so the banks are moving in that direction. And really, it's for us to nudge them so that they can understand and settle into a, a, a structure that works even better for them. Because the old historic approach also had with it a lot of problems um, in, in, in risk pricing. And so I hope that answers the question. It's more a question of us working with our banks. It's not a deadline that you don't finish by this date and then this happens. It's a, it's a question of working together. But it comes down to technology and using the new AI and other approaches in order to understand and differentiate between your customers. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Governor. Um, my next question is to Charlie. Um, last month at Jackson Hall, we saw the uh, Fed Chair announce a new approach to inflation uh, that could keep interest rates lower for longer, uh, which implies a weaker dollar. What does a weak US dollar and low EM inflation mean for currencies in emerging and frontier markets? and for East Africa in particular? Well, big picture, we've got emerging market foreign exchange is still about the cheapest it's been in 15 years. Um, and the most startling undervalued currencies are Latin America, South Africa, countries which happen also to have been hit pretty hard, particularly hard in Latin America by COVID, and then hit by the commodity story as well. Um, so my assumption is that they are going to be the ones that benefit uh, considerably as we go into into 2021 and beyond um, but what's one of the trends that i find most interesting is that the disinflation story that we saw in japan from the 1990s europe in the 2000s and i'd argue probably in the states in the 2010s it's just the death of inflation really uh, since since the peak back in 1980 uh, the death of developed market inflation, I think, might also be coming into emerging markets. And so the consequence of that is we're now seeing interest rates in places like Russia and Brazil at 200-year lows. And we've never, well, I mean, like since independence in Brazil in 1823, I think it was, uh, and Russia as well, the lowest interest rates they've ever had, low single digits. Um, and, and I think South Africa even, despite its massive deficits, uh, also extremely low interest rates, and they may stay there because we may not see inflation come back. Um, so I think this is going to change the carry trade story a bit. Uh, you'll have to be uh, borrowing at the short end in these local currencies and, and, and buying the long end, and perhaps the, the, yield, the local yield curves in emerging markets will flatten at quite low levels. And at that point, sometime in the next few years, investors will be saying, where is the yield on offer? Uh, and in, we've already talked about the dollar bond markets, I think will be very attractive. But I think it's going to also shift into local currency as well. But I'm not sure that inflation is going to die in the same way in frontier markets. Um, and I think that's, that's true for a number of reasons. Firstly, inflation in frontier markets tends to be much more food price dependent. 30 to 50% of CPI baskets tend to be food versus 20 in emerging or 10 in developed. Uh, and food is obviously volatile and depends on the harvests. Good numbers we get in Kenya now is, is helped obviously by the harvest, as, as the deputy governor said. Um, secondly, there's oil, which, which can't be controlled. And thirdly, there's the, the currency itself. But there I would think the weaker dollar is going to be helpful. The weaker dollar will help um, the, the local currency GDP versus external debt ratios look better, the debt to GDP ratios will look better uh, and you get into a virtuous circle where people are prepared to lend more because the dollar's weakening so 
frontier markets look like they can manage more debt um, and, and then they can grow faster because they can borrow more uh, and that again encourages more money in. We saw that to some extent in the late 2000s um, and I think we're going to see an echo of that in, in the 2020s. Um, but I, I, I guess what I find particularly interesting about Kenya is that it's, although the currency looks a bit strong on our real effect or exchange rate models, but the currency has held up well for many years. Um, and when inflation drops as much as this and, and is sitting down at four or five percent, any worsening of that a real effect exchange rate analysis isn't really happening. It's very different in, in Nigeria where inflation keeps on being double digit. So every year the currency is looking more and more overvalued. Um, so I'm quite encouraged by what we're seeing in, in, in Kenya at the moment. I think it's, uh, it's good news. I, I'd, I'd be quite interested if, if it's okay to jump in with one question about on the currency because our real effective exchange rate numbers we have two models which complicates things in, in one in London and one that Yvonne does um, but the currency is moving towards that in the last few months in Kenya it's gone from what 100 to 101 to about 108 and I was wondering what what the central bank sees as, as having contributed to that I don't know if you want me to, to respond Yes, the question is for you, Deputy Governor. Okay. Um, I think what we saw is, I don't know, the 101 um, number seems to be a little old. I think as we came into the year, we were around 103. Um, and uh, with the advent of COVID, uh, we saw that go to 105. We compared that movement with what was happening across the African continent, and we saw that 3 to 4% um, was, was, was fairly... Um, standard was fairly standard and so as I say we don't have a rate on the shilling but we observe um, so that was fairly standard um, in the recent past um, we've seen something quite interesting because normally around September time you have a lot of dividends being paid and uh, obviously with the banking sector this year um, it's not as predictable as it was in the past in the past you knew that year upon year dividends would remain fairly um, steady um, but obviously this year some banks have decided not to pay dividends etc etc um, but we did see a large uh, uh, some large dividend flows coming through uh, which put some pressure um, on the shilling uh, so I, I would say that that's my understanding of it at this point in time but the flows in and out still remain fairly fairly balanced um, the reserves are robust um, the current account is is going in you know it's, it's not widening um, so we see no reason for the shilling to take a lot of pressure. Thank you, uh, Deputy Governor. My next question is to the IMF, and this is uh, regarding the fiscal situation. Uh, so that's one area of concern for Kenya. So prior to the pandemic, um, the government did struggle to meet its revenue to GDP uh, targets, and that resulted in breaches of uh, the deficit. Um, and this particular year, taxes were cut, rightly so, to help uh, stimulate uh, growth. However, my question to you is, what does that imply for the revenue outlook over the medium term? Um, and also the ability for their government to achieve the fiscal consolidation targets? Yeah. So, um, on, on, on revenue, uh, I, I, I think... First, it, it's important to note that uh, the tax cuts that were undertaken in, in April mm -hmm. uh, helped stimulate economic activity and, and were an important part of, of Kenya's uh, COVID response. Uh, providing stimulus is, is, is of course, uh, sound policy when e economy slump. So, so. Uh, that, that was a, a positive there. Uh, the, the question then is, is more forward looking and, and, and looking ahead to a time when uh, recovery from, the, the, from COVID at, at, at permits uh, a reversal of, of, of stimulus, uh, th then it's going to be important to bring the revenue to GDP ratio back up. Uh, this is 
essential in terms of, of being able to reduce the, the fiscal deficit, uh, bring debt to GDP ratios down uh, while creating room for, for, for needed spending. Um, on, on, on revenues, I, I, I would also note that there are different ways to, to bring them up. Uh, what perhaps has not been getting as much attention as, as the tax cuts is that there has been, uh, in fact, significant action to remove uh, tax expenditures and, and, and streamline the tax system uh, alongside the tax cuts. Kenya, Kenya has had uh, large tax expenditures estimated at, at 5 to 6 percent of, of, of GDP, uh, has now taken steps to, uh, to bring that down by uh, around one percentage point of, of, of GDP. Um, so, so that's part of, I, I think, the story towards uh, bringing revenues back up again to uh, to help with the, the fiscal pressures. Uh, the removing of the exemptions facilitates administration. It, it, it makes the tax system more efficient. So I, I, I think that's, that's a very positive part of, of, of the process. Okay. Thank you. Um, that leads on to my next question, Charlie, and this one's for you. Um, as you know, debt metrics have uh, deteriorated um, Quite a bit in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and can, some countries more than others. How do you expect um, this crisis to impact uh, the region and Kenya's access to commercial loans going forward, over the medium term in particular? Um, and do you think Frontier Africa and Kenya in particular remain compelling for bond investors? I think the yields are very interesting, um, but we are going to see countries and we've just seen Angola get downgraded by Moody's last night. Um, I think they were downgraded by another agency on Friday night. Um, we've got debt restructuring talks in Zambia. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that they are the highest fertility countries or among the highest fertility countries in Africa, which comes back to the whole lack of savings um, and the dependence on foreign borrowing um, story that we've talked about. Um, so there's undoubtedly going to be countries that that are going to struggle. Um, and I, I think for the next few months, I still think global investors are going to be fairly cautious ahead of the US elections. No one's going to be taking big bets, I don't think, in terms of asset allocation. Um, I think the shift comes in, 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 in next year. Um, but what's striking is already how low the yields are um, in emerging markets. And obviously, we focus quite a lot on Russia as well. And you know, we're seeing corporates being able to issue in relatively low single digits out of Russia, even with all the noise about, you know, the, the, the Navalny story and, and the Germans and, and the tension going on there. Um, still, and the yield on offer to investors is, is very low. Um, so I, I, think, I think that there has to be uh, a shift back towards uh, looking for where the yield is, is available. And I think the more countries that, that avoid this pressure to bail in the private sector that's come from the World Bank, or almost David Malpass, I think, in particular, um, the, the better. Because I think there's so much capital that could be put to work in the continent, but would be deterred if, when a crisis comes, you get penalised. And, and I guess this is one of my original points about it. Is when the crisis hit in February, March, developed markets, the Fed comes in and bails everyone out in the private sector. If you're a private sector investor in US stock market, you get bailed out by the Fed. But somehow, if you're a private sector investor in African debt, then, then the pressure seemed to be you should be penalized, which runs entirely counter to what we've been trying to promote for the last decade or more, which is that Africa is normalizing. This is a, 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 we're seeing development and success and growth, as Tobias already mentioned, some of the best growth, both in the global financial crisis came from Africa, and again this time is going to come from Africa, and, and money should be coming to the continent, not penalised for coming to the continent. Um, and that's why I think it's quite important that countries try and avoid this pressure 
to bail in the private sector, because I think the private sector will offer far more money to the continent in the coming decade. There will be exceptions. To come back to the original, my start, there will be exceptions. And Angola or Zambia, they're going to they're struggle for a little while. Um, and there will inevitably be others in a continent this size. Um, but I think, I think the money is, is likely to flow. Um, and that's partly, again, premised on a shift in the American politics as well, that a less protectionist, less trade war minded president will shift global sentiment towards emerging markets in general, um, as well as Africa. I think that's coming. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, my next question is for uh, the deputy governor. This was uh, from our banks analyst who was looking at NPLs in the banking sector, which stood at around 13% in June. Um, and um, he thinks they're already elevated going into the crisis and naturally deteriorated further this year. And he wanted to find out whether the central bank is comfortable with NPA ratios in the 15 to 20% range in 2021, or, would it, or could it uh, potentially compel the banks to write off fully provisioned assets? Um, thank you. I think that this is... Uh one of the issues that I brought up uh, earlier and said that uh, I hoped I'd have the opportunity to return to. Um, I think when we look at the, um, the, the NPLs in the Kenyan market, you'll excuse me, I'm, yes, I found my, my, my notes on this. Um, firstly, we're saying that, that you know, the COVID has been a global um, crisis and so all banks around the world will be looking at their asset quality. So it's not unique to the African continent or to Kenya. So I think that's the first thing that we need to put on the table. The second thing is that our banks were well capitalized and uh, very liquid, strong liquidity positions even as we entered this crisis. So the banks have averaged 50% liquidity. Um, so they were very well positioned uh, for the crisis. Um, our banks still remain profitable at 17%, as I said earlier. The issue was the asset quality, and particularly credit, as we go forward. So we acted very quickly, and we said that we want our banks to look at their credit position, their asset quality position, as at the 2nd of March 2020. And I, as I told you before, the, the COVID crisis hit us on the 13th. And we said anything before that should be treated as per normal um, structures. Anything post that, when we start looking at the deterioration of um, of credit post the second of March, should be classified as partly as a COVID-related um, issue. And as a result, what we said is that the bank should look to um, what's the right way to be flexible and accommodative to customers who are hit in that way. And then we also took our own actions by reducing the CRR and providing our banking sector with additional funding to help in this, in this respect. Our view is that it's very important that not only our banks get across the post-COVID line, but also their customers. If you get a bank that has no customers and it's strong post-COVID, it's still not a strong bank, it's still a viable bank. So the two need to cross together. But at the same time, we don't want to cross with, um, with institutions or with companies that are failing out of their own, um, their own actions. There's a difference between your own actions and COVID. And so we wanted to distinguish between the two. NPLs in July, as I say, are 13.3, but in August were 13.1. So we're seeing a stabilization of that position. Um, when I look at the actual numbers that we have, uh, we gave additional liquidity in the banking sector to the CR reduction of 350 million US dollars, which is 14 million US dollars, which is about 18 million US dollars, has been utilized. It's been utilized where we want it to be utilized, so it's a trade transport communication with the state. Uh, and this the restructuring of our banking sector is about 29% of the total book. Now the issue is, is what happens as you go forward, which is also very, very important. Um, and what we're saying is that we can continue to diligently monitor and watch um, the, the NPLs. And as I say, they've, they've stabilized. And in addition to that, we continue to engage with the global debate 
on how these will be managed globally, because it's not just a Kenyan problem. And we want to align ourselves with the best, the best in, in, in class. So is this just a is there a structure around it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I think Charlie has a question for you around QE. Yes, Deputy Governor. I just what struck me in this crisis was that in 08, developed markets did QE, emerging markets cut interest rates, and, and Frontier did not. Uh, in this crisis, developed markets did bigger QE, emerging markets like South Africa interestingly did a bit of QE and Frontier was able to cut interest rates. So it feels like all central banks everywhere are generally getting more dovish or reacting in more uh, different ways. Did Kenya ever consider QE? Uh, did this kind of policy stance, just in terms of the, the concerns about crowding out, the government's borrowing a lot, uh, credit actually seems to be okay. There seems to be real credit growth in Kenya, which is quite interesting. Um, and quite encouraging, but but did the central bank ever think about QE type policies? I think what what happened was that um, when the crisis struck us, we um, engaged with a Pan African um, uh, debate, and then you looked as to what was the best response for your domestic economy at that time, and so the issues and the, the solutions and measures that were put in place um, aligned to what we believed would be the best the best for the Kenyan, which would respond best to the Kenyan economy. But you are, of course, aware that uh, the government also had quite a lot of stimulus. They had uh, programs for vulnerable groups. Um, um, they're even in the budget that has passed recently in Parliament for, for this year. Um, there's, there's, there's a large amount of um, additional stimulus in, in that program. Um, and then in addition, we're, there's a new program that's coming, which is a credit guarantee scheme uh, for MSB. So uh, we looked at what we had, we looked at what was available, and then we decided which would be best in the circumstances for Kenya. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have to wind down now, um, and I, I have to pose one question that's come through from the audience. This is for you. Uh, Tobias, it's regarding the currency. Uh, it's often a question that comes up. Um, basically, the question is around the misalignment of the shilling. And I think they're referring to a 2008 IMF report, uh, which at the time talked about the currency being overvalued, um, uh, around 17% overvalued. Um, I, I think they want an update on what the, um, the IMF's view is on the valuation of the currency today and how your mode of valuation differs from that of the central bank. Thank you, Yvonne. So, so th that report that you referred to was, was from 2018 and, and was in fact looking in particular at, at 2017 uh, data, if, if I recall. So it, it, it's uh, somewhat dated, I, I would say. Uh, we haven't put out an updated uh, assessment of, of, of the exchange rate at, at this point. So what I, I would just note is, is that we've actually seen a, a, a improvement in, in uh, the external current account uh, since 2017, uh, and in particular, actually, this year. Uh, so I, I, I think that alongside with, with uh, that uh, modest depreciation of, of the shilling uh, we've seen would, would suggest that, that uh, what, what misalignment there may have been previously would, would be somewhat uh, less at, at, at this point. Um, but as I said, we, we, we still need to do that uh, in-depth analysis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my final question will be to the Deputy Governor as a senior official in Kenya. As you know, the audience is largely made up of um, investors who are investing across several frontier and emerging markets, including Kenya. Uh, please tell them why they should invest in Kenya at this point in time. 
thank you. Thank you, Renaissance, for giving us this opportunity. And thank you to the audience for being interested in listening to Kenya. I would say that Kenya is the third largest, uh, arguably, the third largest uh, sub-Saharan African economy. We don't have mineral resources. Our strength comes from our commitment, hard work, adherence to the law, and international collaboration. Kenya is one of Africa's most diverse economies, which protects us somewhat from shocks, global and otherwise, when they come. Um, we're not reliant on commodity exports, over 40% of our exports to the region, and we have an open and free capital and forex markets. Kenya, we believe in ourselves. 95% of our domestic debt, we have bought ourselves. Above 75% of our securities exchange is owned by Kenyans. And you know, when people own something themselves and believe in themselves, then that's a good reason for other people to believe in them. Kenya has sustained um, mac macroeconomic stability despite global and national shocks. Inflation around 5%, exchange rate relatively stable, growth around 5% plus for the last 10 years adequate reserves, predictable current account, stable, resilient banking system, which is anchored on international best practice. We're a, go a global digital leader. Kenyas are innovative with a strong private sector. Kenya has, as one of its lead, is one of the leading and fastest growing domestic debt markets in Africa. It's predictable yield curve, safe settlement and custody system, managed by the central bank, no forex restrictions on, on movements. And I'd like to announce as I close that yesterday we launched um, a project to introduce a new central settlement depository system within Kenya. And this system is aligned to the one that won the Global Settlement System Central Bank Award in 2020. So in a year, a year and a half's time, will also have the best settlement structure um, that the world recognizes as the best settlement structure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the panelists for giving of their valuable time and for this engaging discussion we've just had. I'd like to uh, thank the audience that dialed in and participated with their questions that contributed to this discussion. My takeaway from our panel session is that Recent data coming out of Kenya is encouraging and does suggest that Kenya may have escaped the worst of this crisis. Thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.